Hello and welcome to our latest webinar where today we will look at folio nutrition on potatoes and the sugar beet crop. The plan as we go through the, the presentation is to split into two halves. The first half we will look at potatoes and then the second half we will focus on sugar beet. So we will start by looking at the basics of nutrition. Always good uh, to go back to basics and, and start at the very starting point of getting things like the soil right. Um, although the focus is obviously on folio nutrition, if we don't get the start right, then um, we're on a hiding to nothing with, with folio nutrition. We'll then look at the nutrient requirements of potatoes, uh, and then we'll look at the foliars, so Yara Vita for potatoes and where they fit. And then we'll do the same for sugar beet. Again, we'll look at the the key nutrient requirements for the crop um, and again where the foliar products fit and then a reminder at the end of the uh, of the key recommendations uh, for, for 2023. I always start with this slide um, and those that have seen my webinars before know I start with this slide that we've got to get the basics right first and a crop will only ever yield as much as the most limiting factor. And that might not be nutrition. It might be that the soil conditions um, are, are not acceptable. There could be compaction, there could be drainage issues. Uh, it could be other growth factors, so limiting of sunshine or, or as we've experienced the last couple of months, too much rainfall. Obviously, we can't really control the weather. Uh, we can have a massive impact on the soil and that should always be our starting point. But ourselves as Yara, our area of expertise is managing that crop nutrition. All those nutritional elements that work together to um, to optimize yields. Again, people get bored of this slide, but I don't. The importance of soil pH it is one of the most fundamental things for managing crop nutrition. And it's one that is often overlooked and it can play such a massive part in the availability of nutrients. We always recommend six and a half as the pH for arable soils. Why? Because that is a point where nutrients are most available. Um, and it's critical. An example of this, um, this is a grass field and you can see there's some very clear green lines um, where the, the grass has droughted out but there's clearly something happening and it is no magical solution out of a can. It is actually the liming effect where the football pitch has been marked out for the whole season we can then see more grass growth in those areas where the, the lime marker has had a liming effect. Um, so it, it just backs up that the pH is absolutely critical for everything we do. And with potatoes, it's fair to say we're not always getting it right. If we look down the left hand side, so the, the red, orange and, and yellow bars, that's almost 50% of crops are suboptimal for pH. Um, so this is where soil analysis has come in with potatoes as the next crop in that sort of five season period, 2016 to 2020, almost 50% is suboptimal pH. Um, we really should be addressing this before we do anything with, with nutrition. It is fundamental basics of growing crops. We then need to then focus on macronutrition. Um, and a picture paints a thousand words. So you can see with those two rows of potatoes, there was an issue with the um, with the liquid fertilizer kit at planting. And you can see about, what, 20, 30 yards down the field, the machine came back on. Um, a picture paints a thousand words. That's what happens if we don't get the macronutrients right, that nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, and sulfur. They are the core building blocks of any crop nutrition strategy, get the basic macronutrition right before we think about micronutrition. And over the last 18 months, nearly two years now, with the price of fertilizer, there's been a lot of conversations around improving nutrient use efficiency. And I don't need to tell any potato growers that, that are listening that the, the problem with the potato crop is, as that picture clearly shows, you cannot cut back on the macronutrition. Yes, with cereals, we can we can do a calculation. We look at our P and K and we can say, well, 
the average yield response is 0.3 of a ton. We can do the financials and then make a decision whether we do it or not. Fundamentally, with a potato crop, it's all or nothing when you're growing that crop. Um, so we need to then optimize that. And how can we how can we do that? Well, I'll go back to my previous slide. If we're not optimizing the pH, um, then a lot of the nutrition we're putting in is getting locked up. So that's a very, very basic starting point. But macronutrient, absolutely critical. Why do we call macros macros? Because they're required in kilograms per hectare or kilograms per ton, whereas the micronutrients are required in grams per hectare or grams per ton. Um, and potassium is, is one of those one of those nutrients for potatoes, which is required in huge amounts. As you can see there in the in the right -hand corner of the table from RB209, you know, a 50 ton a hectare crop at an index one or two is looking at like 300 kilos of, of potassium. You can't really cut that back because it is so vital for things like tuber quality, disease control, and tuber size. Um, but as you can see on the on in the red writing, there's a lot of negative impacts and again a lot of them are soil focused so ph again acidic soils will reduce the availability um, light sandy soils heavy rainfall irrigation can lead to, to leaching drought conditions we've not had many of them in the last two months for sure um, again can limit uptake and then other interactions with other nutrients so things like magnesium high applications of magnesium um, can then have a negative impact on potash availability but the fundamental message is with something like potash, if you don't get that base potash right in the soil, there really is no, no point in worrying about foliar applications. Because you can see there, you cannot replace 300 kilos a hectare of, of potash. You've got to get it right. Phosphate, a really, really important nutrient, like in other crops, uh, it has an impact on rooting and potatoes, that, that impact largely um, is positive positive on things like tuber numbers um, and then ultimately yield and you can see the graph on the right hand side the the, the first side of that graph is the the total number of tubers per, per meter cubed in the soil at 0 50 100 200 and 400 kilos of, of potassium sorry of, of phosphate um, and the right hand side is that final yield and you can see again from that 100 kilos once you start dropping back off to 50 and 0 the yield drops substantially. So again, um, having adequate phosphate is really, really important. Um, and again, it can have a big impact on the amount of tubers. It can have a big impact on the size of the tubers and the uniformity of the tubers. Um, so phosphate is all about the tubers. We've covered this before in previous webinars uh, and the potato crop, the fundamentals are no different. That phosphate is highly, highly limited by soil pH. At low pHs, it's locked up by iron and aluminium. At high pHs, it's locked up by calcium. Again, at those high pHs, there really is not a lot you can do um, because if you're on a, a chalky wild soil with a pH of eight, eight and a half, you're going to have a job to remove chalk. But those 50% of the crops at suboptimal pH, you are locking up maybe up to half of the phosphate straight away. So whilst the price is high, we need to maximize uh, the nutrient use efficiency. You're not going to do that if your pH is suboptimal. Organic matter, there is a big drive we know for it, improving organic matters. And again, increased organic matters generally lead to more nutrient availability. Um, so soils with low organic matters, again, will impede phosphate availability to the crop. Uh, soil temperature, particularly cold and wet soils. So, you know, a lot of the potatoes that have already gone in the ground, it's not been warm and it's been very wet um, the last sort of six to seven weeks. So again, there could be there could be an impact there. And the other thing with with, with phosphate, we know, is it's very very immobile in the soil, uh, and we've seen this again in, in other presentations. Too late for this year's crop, but something to think about for future crops is the placement of fertilizer. Placement of fertilizer can make obviously phosphate a lot more available because you're actually putting it where it's required rather than broadcasting it on the soil. Um, and we know placement fertilizer is a common practice on potatoes. Uh, we know it works on other crops. 
Um, but it's something to consider. So if you are a potato grower and you're not currently placing, it's something to think about. Uh, and from ourselves at Yara, we have a full range of liquid and solid products um, that are available to be placed at the point of planting. It's all about making that nutrient more available because you're putting it where it's needed and, and phosphate is, is the real key one. Now we haven't done any trials for a long time, it's approaching sort of 13, 14 years since we last did trials. Um, but you can see from that range of trials in a number of geographical locations um, around, around the country, we're roughly looking at around a 10% yield increase from placement versus broadcast. Um, so it really is something to consider with, with the price of uh, the inputs, not just fertilizer, but, but machinery, labor, electric, we really need to optimize our potato production and a move from broadcasting to placement can, can certainly help. Um, so too late for this crop that's in the ground now. And yes, we're, we're here to talk about foliars, but again, we've got to get the basics right to then optimize the yield with foliars. Um, and this, this for me is, is one core way we can, we can do that. So something to, something to consider. Now there is pros and cons of placement. I, I always like to be honest. Um, I think I've covered most of the, uh, most of the pros. Um, I suppose the only thing I didn't cover is the wastage aspect. You're only applying um, the product to the areas of the fields where the potatoes are going to be planted. Whereas if you broadcast all those corners in headlands and the, the inside runs where we, where we use for our irrigation and such like, we could be putting fertilizer on there that's actually not going to grow a crop. Whereas with placement, you are only putting it actually in the ridge where the potato seed is going. Um, all the others we've, you know, we've covered. Like I say, it's not all, not all positive. Um, Got to be balanced. And the negatives of placement would be things like work rates. You know, they can slow work rates because you've got more to, to go on the planter at that point. Um, operator workload. I mean, there you go. Uh, how many more screens can we fit in a cab and still be able to see out the window? But you know, with, with, with modern potato planters, you've got seed, you've got fungicides, um, you could have nematicides, you then go and put fertilizer on it as well. You're asking that operator to do a heck of a lot. Um, so yeah, it could be perceived as a, as a negative point. Um, and then with, with some of the liquid grades, the potassium concentration could be limiting um, because there is a limit to how much potassium we can, we can, we can get in. Um, now to combat that, the, the one, one thing we do know is common practice is placement of nitrogen and phosphate with, with MOP type products broadcast. That is, that is common practice. Um, so we're placing a proportion of the nitrogen, the phosphate, which is the most immobile nutrient, and we're putting it where we need it around those tubers, and then we can broadcast the MOP. That is common practice to get over some of these, these negatives that, that can impact when we are placing fertilizer. Just briefly want to talk about calcium because we have another webinar which you can find on the YouTube channel focused purely on calcium on potatoes. Um, and calcium is, is an essential plant nutrient. It's not, you know, I would class it as a secondary nutrient. Um, and again, you know, what calcium has some serious functions within the plant. So it needs decent amounts. You know, we could use up to 50 kilograms a hectare of calcium re required on a potato crop. Um, and with calcium, it's all around quality, basically, improved tuber quality, improved um, storability, less bruising, et cetera, better skin finish. That's what we see with, with calcium and the impact. Um, again, what I would say is, whilst this, this is a webinar looking at foliars and, and Yara Vita, my advice is if you want calcium, it's got to be applied through the soil, around the tubers, where it's needed. Um, it's very, very difficult to put calcium in through foliage and get it all the way down to those tubers. So our core recommendation is Yara Lever Tropico applied at tuber initiation. This is the most effective option for calcium supply to the potato crop. 
as I've said, there is there is a full webinar on quality um, of potatoes, looking at calcium. The the one thing with Tropico is you are guaranteed a fully water water soluble calcium product, whereas some of the other forms of calcium out there in the market are insoluble. They are very difficult and require considerably more water for the tubers to be able to take that calcium up. So that's all I want to say on calcium because I say there is another webinar. So if you search on the YouTube channel, if you're watching this, you'll be able to find that webinar. So I now want to move to, to foliar applications. So our Yara Vita range of products. We have a full range of products for, for the potato crop. Um, however, we have some very specific products with core recommendations um, where they are widely used and, and we know they, they perform in, in given situations. And again, the first one is phosphate. So foliar phosphate, MagFos K. Um, we've already mentioned with phosphate that it's all about tubers. Tuber, tuber number, tuber bulking. That's the prime function of, of phosphate within the potato crop. So the first application of foliar phosphate would be done at tuber initiation to increase tuber numbers. So if you're looking at pure tuber numbers, then this is the application. Um, so if you're thinking of a seed crop or a salad crop where we want many, many smaller smaller uh, tubers, then, then MagFos K at tuber initiation. Um, and for this, we recommend one application of 10 litres a hectare. And that's when 50% of the tips are twice the size of the stolon. So a bit of an example there of, of, of the approximate, approximate timing. Um, arguably slightly late, but it gives, a, gives an indication. Um, and again, we, we've got rafts of trials data. I'm not gonna, not gonna put loads of trials data up on this, but we've got lots of trials data done on the various foliar P products that we have in the Yara Vita range, um, where we can increase tuber numbers by this, this timing. Um, so so that's, that's one time point. The actual time where the bulk of the product is used is during tuber bulking. So when we have a full canopy like this, um, and this is where we're looking to increase tuber size. And again, we've got many, many years worth of trials data on this. And if you actually analyze all the data, we're looking at around an 8% yield increase from these applications of things like MagFos K, um, the foliar phosphate products during tuber bulking. Uh, really is common practice with, with the potato crop to use these, these at this timing. Um, once you've got the, the phosphate right at the start, you know, get the soil applications right and then you use this to enhance it, um, is, is to push phosphate into that potato crop during the bulking stage. Um, so once you've got tubers sort of, once they get to marble towards ping pong ball size, that's when I would start the applications. Um, and for that, we actually recommend two applications of five litres uh, a hectare, roughly 10 to 14 days apart. So practically, what does that mean? Um, for me, that means we put five litres on with a blight spray. Um, we, we then go with the next blight spray on its own. And then the following one, we go again. So, so in that sort of 14 day period, you're getting those two applications. So you want to be that 10 to 14 days apart. In, in the real world, but five litres a hectare, and this is this is common practice, just to aid bulking of those tubers. And I just want to share some some demonstration work that, that one of my colleagues did last year um, in in East Yorkshire, and this was a uh, a demo trial site, so it's not replicated, um, but the, the the trials were done, and we took pictures through the growing period, and then we. Um, we obviously did, did trial digs and, and, and weighed them out to, to work out the yields. Um, and you can see there on the left in these trials, we looked at two different things. We looked at the MagFos K on its own, and then we looked at the MagFos K with a biostimulant product. And actually, the combination of the two, we got better uniformity. Um, but when we come onto the yields, you can see actually there was a massive, massive yield increase by that MagFos K. Um, so there's just two pictures there showing the MagFos K on the left. And the MagFos K plus the Biotrack Biostimulant on the right, where we've got, um, I believe, a better uniformity of tubers. When it comes to the actual yield, we've got total yield on the left and marketable yield 45 to 80 mil on the right. Um, and you can see there when we put the, uh, the control lines in, 
Um, we've got the untreated in the green, the MAGFOS K twice in the orange, and the MAGFOS K plus the BioTrack twice in the blue. Um, and you can see we've got a big, big uplift in yield, um, both total yield and marketable yield from the application of the MAGFOS K, um, and then the BioTrack, the, the biostimulant added a little bit more on top, but the big yield increase came from that MAGFOS K. When we then look at the different size grades, um, again, if we put, put a lining, you can see particularly that 60 to 80 mil segment, we've had a big, big increase in tuber, tuber size. That's what that MAGFOS K does, it bulks those tubers. Um, again, I'm a believer in pictures, you can, you can see it there. We take the, the top left three trays versus the top right three trays, you can see we've got more bakers and, and a bigger uniformity size on the right hand side um, when, we, when we washed up the samples. The other thing with a product like MagFos K, whilst it contains a very, very high concentration of, of, of phosphate, it also has some potassium in there to supplement. Uh, it also contains magnesium. And magnesium, again, is a key, key nutrient for any crop when it comes to chlorophyll production uh, and then photosynthesis. Uh, and as you can see there, the, the potato leaves on the right versus on the left is the effect of, of magnesium deficiency. And all we're trying to do is, is keep that crop utilizing sunlight. Uh, it's no different to any crop. Um, the canopy basically is a solar panel. So it's utilizing that, that solar radiation to then drive plant sugars and, and turn into yields. And again, the supply from the soil with magnesium is often limited by soil pH. Um, and then things like sandy soils, uh, high applications of potassium, and then water availability. So if we enter a period of drought, magnesium we always see on the oldest leaves first. Um, so again, it's another nutrient to, to consider. If the soil analysis is really low, then the best thing we can do is put magnesium in the soil. But then we need to follow that up with, uh, with foliar applications. And using something like MAGFOS K um, has magnesium in it, along with the phosphate and the potassium. Another micronutrient to think about that, that, that can have an impact, um, particularly on things like skin finish. And again, we've, we've, not got, we've not got the data, but it's anecdotal that we hear from potato growers and agronomists that where they include zinc in the program, they have, they have better skin finish. Um, and there's just a couple of trials there where we've looked at applying Zintrac um, on, on potatoes. And you can see we have, a, we have an impact on marketable yield. Um, and again, when we, when we look at zinc availability, um, if we're putting large amounts of phosphorus on and phosphate on, we could have a negative impact on zinc availability. So again, it's something to think about. Um, and actually, you know, again, the function of zinc within the plant is around stability of plant sugars. Um, and again, no matter what the plant. So, so that can in turn reduce disease risks. Now, I'm not saying put zinc on and don't put any blight sprays on uh, at all, but we know with all nutrition, if you keep the plant healthy, um, natural defenses get built. So if you are considering zinc as a problem, then what you could do is switch from MAGFOS K into um, Yaravita Crop Boost. So this, this product has exactly the same P and K loading as, as MAGFOS K. So it's still a foliar, foliar phosphate product. The only difference is we've removed some of the magnesium and added in some zinc. So if you do think, you know, you've got risk of zinc deficiency or tissue PTL testing is saying so, um, then we would recommend using Crop Boost instead of MAGFOS K. Use at exactly the same rate. So if you put in five litres of MAGFOS K on, we put five litres of Crop Boost. What I would say is, if you need zinc, do not be tempted to add Zintrac to MAGFOS K because they are incompatible. So if you do need zinc, you must move to the Crop Boost product. Do not add Zintrac to MAGFOS K because you won't get it out of the sprayer very easily. So if you need zinc, move into Crop Boost. Something that's come up in conversation with colleagues in, in, in Europe is the, um, the impending loss of Manka Zeb. Um, now, again, we're, we're talking nutrition, we're not talking fungicides, but Manka Zeb does supply 
um, a considerable amount of manganese, copper and zinc into the plant. Um, and my colleagues in, in Holland and Belgium, they use a product called Multitrep, which you can see the composition there. It's a, it's a multi-nutrient containing magnesium, manganese, zinc and copper. Um, we actually sell it here. Uh, it's called Gramitrel, which is used on cereals. Um, but, but over there in, in Holland and Belgium, they, they use that product Multitrel to drip feed those key nutrients into um, the potato crop. Because again, we know things like manganese, magnesium, et cetera, are all important. So that, that's something they do. Um, one thing we decided to look at was rather than use Gramitrel and get messages mixed up with, um, with, uh, with, with cereals, we have a product called Mancazin, which is manganese, copper, and zinc. Um, and at two liters a hectare, it provides quite high loading of both of uh, all three of those nutrients. So last year in our fully replicated um, contractor trials that, that we do, we decided to add Mancazin in just to see what impact that had. Um, and this was a site where there was no Mancazin used in the blight program. I will add that. The blight had a full blight program, but there was no Mancazeb used in that. Um, so the manganese, copper and zinc was coming from this product. Uh, we did two applications, one at early tuber bulking and again, one sort of 14 days later, because again, we wanted to look at the MAGFOS K um, type timing as well. Again, when we look at the yields, we've got the total yields in the left and in the right, we've got that marketable yield 45 to 80 mil put in the, uh, the lines on the controls, which is the light green. You can see, again, we've got a positive yield increase from the MAGFOS-K um, over the untreated. We got, what, three tons a hectare in, um, three and a half tons a hectare in total yield and two and a half tons a hectare in marketable yield. Where we added the, the buyer track in with the MAGFOS-K, we took that yield up even further. Um, so again, the biostimulant is adding something, particularly to that marketable yield. So again, you can see we've taken it up another approximately four tons a hectare. Um, the biostimulant on its own, yeah, jury's out. I think you know we've seen in a lot of trials the combination of the biostimulant plus the the the, the folio nutrition, what what delivers the, the most consistent results. Um, the interesting one was that mancazin which is in the dark green. And you can see the mancazine actually across all the trials in that, that replicate trial was the highest yield in plots. So we're gonna repeat that again this year. Um, but if you are looking for a, for, for a foliar product that contains manganese, copper and zinc, then mancazine um, would, would be a really good fit uh, for the potato crop. Again, that's just showing the, uh, the, the differences in size when we've, when we've graded them out. Um, but again, a clear response to that, that MAGFOS K and, and biostimulant improving that marketable yield in that 45 to 80 mil category. You can see um, the, the orange and the light blue bars versus the light green untreated bars. Um, so the, the, these were fully replicated um, scientific trials, whereas the previous one I showed in East Yorkshire was, was just a demonstration trial. But it's good to see the, the impact on both. Now briefly, briefly move on to biostimulants um, because there is a lot more interest in the market now on biostimulants, but there's a heck of a lot of unanswered questions. Um, so I thought the first thing to do is just what, what do biostimulants do? Well, we know biostimulants can improve tolerance to stress. Um, we know biostimulants can improve nutrient use efficiency. And we know they can improve crop quality. So for the potato crop, we can actually tick all three. Um, and we've seen that in our own trials, that, that improvement in crop quality. The interesting one is the improvement to stress. Um, and for me, I often get asked questions, and particularly last year when, when crops were burning up in July, the phone was ringing and, you know, can I use a biostimulant? Will it be effective? For me, putting a biostimulant on when the crop is already dying is a bit like putting sun cream on once you've got burnt. Um, it's too late, the damage is done. The sun cream should go on before you go out in the sun when you go on holiday, not after the first afternoon around the swimming pool. I know we all do it and we all say we'll learn and then next time we go on holiday, we do the same thing. Um, but you've got to get 
those biostimulants on before that stress hits. Um, the challenge is knowing when that stress is going to come. So I think, you know, the future, if, if we're doing this webinar again in five to seven years time, I can categorically say biostimulants will be so much higher on, on everybody's radar. Um, but, but for that to happen, we also need regulation to tighten a bit, in my own opinion. You know, we need to have proof that these things work because as things currently stand, any of us could buy uh, various raw materials and bottle it up and, and sell it. Um, and that's not that's not great. You know, we need to prove the concept. And for me, if we can then link that into weather models and such like, I think that's where we could really, really nail home this, this stress management with, with biostimulants. When it comes to nutrient use efficiency, it's just ensuring we have healthy plants. Yes, with, with, with products like humic and fulvic acids, we can have an impact on rooting, which again, a bigger root system will improve nutrient use efficiency because we can access more from the soil. Um, and improving crop quality is a given. If, if you look across Europe, where biostimulants have really taken off, uh, it's in those high value crops in that what I call the fresh produce sector. So, so it's in um, you know, vegetables and fruit where we, we can improve crop quality. So we improve the uniformity, which is ultimately what we want. We want marketable yield, not total yield. And if we can improve things like shelf life and storability, um, we can see that happening in fruit crops. Um, and that's where biostimulants have a place. So I think with the potato crop, um, for me, it's, it's, it's one of the starting points. If I was new to biostimulants and I was thinking of trialing them, the potato crop seems a natural fit for me. Last year, we did various split fields. Um, and again, they, they, these are not scientific. These are just where we, we went out and we, we applied the biostimulants on top of what the farmers were doing in parts of the fields. And then we went out and did trial digs at harvest. Um, majority of these were done alongside the farmers. Um, we, we took them back to the yard, we, we washed them up, we graded them out, and then we weighed them to get the yields. Uh, and I just, just share a few of them with you now. So this one was, was Melody up in, up in East Yorkshire. Um, and you can see there, again, a picture paints a thousand words. Um, all we did there was purely treated and untreated yield. We didn't actually go down to the, uh, to, to the size grading on this one, but you can see there we've got a higher yield and actually better tuber uniformity on the right hand side. Um, so, you know, you're looking at three and a half ton a hectare yield increase there. So that was that was quite big. Um, and that's from in all the trials we did the same. We did three litres of biotrack twice. So it's two applications of the biostimulant, um, roughly four weeks apart. Um, this was another one up in Scotland. So different variety, uh, Maribel. Again, we did the two applications around four weeks apart. And this time we did actually size grade everything out. So we've got the total yield on the left, the marketable yield on the right. And the good thing is in this trial, on both occasions, we got a yield increase, both total and marketable. And you can see that when we do do the size grading, particularly in that 60 to 80 mil sector, we've, we've got a nice um, sort of four ton a hectare uplift in, in yield. Um, a picture paints a thousand words and you can see there that improved tuber uniformity on the right versus the untreated on the left. Um, so these pictures were, were taken out in the field during the during the trial digs. Um, and you can see the same again there. However, that same farm had a different field and we had no response to biostimulants. Uh, and this became a bit of a pattern last year. So we, we, we did think around around 12 sites, including the, the replicated sites. Um, and I was getting in positive results. I was getting in negative results. Um, so I then went back and asked questions about irrigation. And it's one year's worth of findings. Um, so I believe in sharing everything we do because we're, we're a knowledge-based company. We're, we're, we're an honest company. Um, and you can see there, not everything was positive. The two replicated trials was the 9.9% and the 15.1% yield increases. Um, and then everything else was, was split field trials. Uh, the average across them all was a 3.5% yield improvement for the application of a biostimulant. But actually, if we look at the unirrigated ones only, it's a 5.7% increase. Um, where we had irrigation, 
you know, the trials actually, you could say they went backwards, um, or we could say there was no difference. But when we actually did the trial data in those key areas of the fields, because we randomized everything, um, yeah, quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting result that that where water was limited, we got a positive response. Now, a lot of you will be thinking, well, that makes total sense because that's where you put a biostimulant on. What I would say is these applications were done during during tuber bulking. They were done later in the season. So had we gone earlier, would the yield increases have been even even higher? Because for me, if you want to um, use a biostimulant for stress tolerance, it's got to be applied earlier in the growing season, not waiting until tuber bulking. Because what we was actually trying to achieve with, with these trials was trying to look at that whole crop quality and tuber uniformity. We wasn't focusing on, on stress mitigation. One year's worth of data, but interesting nonetheless. So our core recommendation on potatoes uh, revolves around the Magfos K, the Folia P products. Um, the first application would be the full 10 litres a hectare at tuber initiation if you want to improve uh, the number of tubers you have. The more common use period would be during that bulking stage. Once those tubers reach tennis ball to ping pong ball size, then I would go at five litres a hectare and then 14 days later, another five litres a hectare. Just a reminder that if you if your crop is also short of zinc, then we would recommend using Crop Boost instead of Magfos K because it's got that added zinc in the mix. When it comes to biostimulants, if we want to mitigate stress, we need to be on early. So my advice, if you're going to use a biostimulant like Biotrack for stress mitigation, the first application wants to be on around three weeks after you've got full crop emergence. I would then put a second application of Biotrack on at three litres a hectare around three weeks after tuber initiation. Um, that would be my recommendation if we're looking at stress mitigation. If you want the biostimulants to help improve uh, marketable yield, then the applications want to be made during bulking alongside the Magfos K stroke crop boost. When it comes to other nutrients, then for me, I would always use tissue testing or PTL testing. Um, to determine what nutrient status is within the plant and then you can treat accordingly but we have a full range of products straight products straight manganeses in the likes of you know mantrak pro we have the the mag flows for the magnesium and then yeah we have the likes of the mancazin type products for manganese copper zinc or even the gramitrel you know if you wanted all of those nutrients they are they are there um, but i'd determine that by by tissue ptl testing would be my advice the MagFos K, the Folia P is the core recommendation. So use tissue testing for the rest. Uh, and just a reminder, do not mix the Folia P products, so the MagFos K, the Crop Boost, the Senifos, with Yaravita suspension concentrates, um, because they don't. Use the Tank Mix website. Don't do it, would be my advice. So that's the core recommendations on potatoes. So just to finish off, I, I want, want to look at the sugar beet crop. Um, and again, key nutrients for sugar beet when it comes to foliar nutrition would be things like boron, uh, magnesium again, which is core on every crop, and, and manganese. Um, boron is really, really important because it present, prevents heart rot. Um, and you can see some examples of, of it there. Um, so what by preventing heart rot, what we do is we boost root yields and we increase um, ultimately the sugar yields, and that's what we want to do. Again, a number of, of interactions within the soil. So sandy soils uh, can lead to, to, to higher boron deficiency. Um, again, alkaline soils, high pH, high calcium levels can, can lock up boron from the soil uh, and periods of drought. You know, boron is very, very immobile within the plant. So when we go into periods of drought, uh, boron deficiency generally shows more and more. Um, Magnesium, just like with potatoes and every other crop, it's all around healthy foliage, uh, chlorophyll, photosynthesis, which leads to increased yields, end of. Um, made worse by sandy soils, soils with a low pH, uh, and again, cold wet periods, when it goes very, very dry, magnesium will show, uh, and, and crops that are very high in potassium. Uh, and just to show you what it, what it looks like there, there's, there's two sugar beet plants, the one on the right is grown with all nutrients, nothing lacking. 
the one on the left is all those nutrients with magnesium taken away. Um, so yeah, there you go. That's what it's critical for. Basically, no magnesium, magnesium deficiency. We don't have a sugar beet plant, and that's just another picture of the same uh, the same plant. So um, I think that says all we need to know about uh, about magnesium on sugar beet. Uh, manganese um, is commonly used on on sugar beet and a relatively routine application, particularly given the fact that sugar beet is often grown on organ organic fen peaty soils. Um, but we also know, again, um, manganese deficiency can show up on sandy soils, again, soils that are acidic with a low pH, and any unconsolidated fluffy seed beds. Again, that, that can have an impact. Um, and early doors, it's all about that. Again, it's all about maintaining a healthy foliage. Um, with uh, manganese deficiency, the only real difference between that and magnesium is it shows up on the youngest leaves first, whereas uh, magnesium deficiency shows shows up on the oldest leaves first. Um, again, with sugar beet, we have a range of straight products that you can use. So there's three of them for the three three nutrients that we talk about. However, we also know with sugar beet that there's a lot of complex tank mixes go on, particularly with herbicides, uh, and particularly this year because a lot of the crops have only just gone in the ground due to the due to the really wet April and, and early part of May. Uh, our product of choice for sugar beet would be Yarvita Brassicol Pro, more com commonly known as an all seed rate product. But if you actually look at those key nutrients, um, it has a very, very high loading of them all, as you can see there in the table. So it adds the boron in, it adds the, the, the magnesium, it adds the, the, the manganese. Um, it's also got some nitrogen, which can help um, with rapid crop uptake. And also, you, you know, I've seen it before myself where we've slightly knocked the crop with a herbicide, um, you know, that brass trail pro application can, uh, can certainly help um, with that bit of nitrogen going into it. And it's also got a high load in the calcium, which again is really important for the whole stem uh, cell strength within the plant. So, so really, really, you know, another really important nutrient. So for me, um, that's our core product of choice for sugar beet is the brass trail pro. It's easy to use, um, safe formulation, it does give a rapid uptake of nutrients, but more importantly, you know, unlike some other formulations, our formulations give this sustained feeding. So they keep feeding the plant for a longer period of time. Um, whereas what you often find with nitrate and sulfate based formulations is, you know, they do a very, very quick uptake of nutrients, but then they drop off quick as well. Whereas the, the, the Yara Vita products, um, they'll feed for a much, much more longer period of time. Uh, and I, again, for me, the big benefit of having all these nutrients in one can is the fact that it's widely tank mixable. Um, please check the website tankmix.com and again in the YouTube sector, section there's a full webinar on tank mix um, but particularly now with, with a very short growing window we could have some really complex tank mixes going on. Do we want to be putting three or four products in the tank when we can put one um, to ensure that we'll, we're enhancing all those nutrients within within the sugar beet crop. Um, that that's that's my view on the product and why we recommend it. Again, just just a couple of pictures from the glass house. So what we've got here on the left hand plot is the control plot. So it's a it's a sugar beet grown in sand where we can control the nutrient uh, concentration that goes in it. So we've grown it with 25% magnesium because if you remember back a couple of slides, without any magnesium. We don't have a plant, um, but then we've taken out the boron, the manganese, and the molybdenum. So it's got every other nutrient, but it's got those three are missing, with only 25% magnesium. The plant on the right, we've done exactly the same thing, but we've added three liters of brassicella applied at the four true leaf stage of the sugar beet crop, um, and that's yeah, pitch paints a thousand words again. So it just shows the product is really, really effective at putting those key nutrients into that sugar beet plant. Uh, and that's it looking from above. So again, identical pots grown exactly the same way. The only difference is the one on the right has had that application of Brassitrol Pro. That's what we recommend on sugar beet. Because ultimately what we're trying to do with the sugar beet crop is have that canopy there to basically maximize sunlight again, it's a solar panel, just like every other crop, and then it turns the sun energy into sugar, 
it goes into the route and then it ends up in the bag on the right hand side uh, and just a big plug for buying british um, if you are out there buying sugar then silver spoon is made with our sugar beet not sugar cane that's been imported the sugar beet crop does have a lot of stress to deal with um, and i'm not even going to talk about things like aphids um, when you look at the, the weather maps for the last two years, in spring 2021, it was all cold and it was frosty. Um, you know, in, in you know, those that remember, I think in April, we had something like 25, 26 frosts out of 30 nights. Um, a year ago, it was drought. Uh, this year, it's been the opposite of drought. But that, again, has led to a stress event because the crop's only just gone in the ground. Um, you know, I was in a field of sugar beet yesterday that was drilled last Wednesday and it's just poking through the ground. Um, and then once it comes through the ground, we're going to start hitting it with herbicide application. So it does come under a lot of stress. Um, so, you know, the old saying is, I'm in Lincolnshire, it should meet across the row by the time of the Lincolnshire show. And I think Suffolk and Norfolk, you all say the same. And the county show is roughly third week in June. Um, how are we going to achieve that this year when it is now I think, the 11th of May? We've got a month and it's only just coming out the ground. Um, we say that because it's it's the previous slide. It's it's creating that canopy to maximise that solar radiation. And actually, this is where biostimulants again can have an impact. And it is an area that we've seen um, with numerous biostimulant products. They can actually have a positive impact on on sugar beet. Um, from, from our range of products, the one we recommend is, is BioTrack. And again, with, with, with my European role, I had I looked at different data from different markets, and the nearest I could find to the UK was Northern France. And if you take Northern France, nip across the water, you're not that far away from East Anglia. Uh, and they did a range of replicated trials where they did two applications of BioTrack at three litres a hectare. Um, and this was the mean of all four trials. And you can see there, that, so they fully replicated, um, and that was around a four ton a hectare yield increase was the mean from all four of these trials. Um, you know, that, that's not to be sniffed at. So whilst we've not done any replicated trials here in the UK, we did some field trials last year. And one in particular I picked out because it's really pertinent to how crops are today. Um, and that was, that was this one. So apologies for the error, I've put 2023 and it should be 2022. Um, so this crop was drilled on the 20th of May. It was re-drilled after the first crop failed due to drought. So you can see why I think it's relevant to today. Um, we haven't had many fail due to drought, but we have some that are only just going in the ground. Um, it had its, its main uh, nitrogen and P and K dressings. And then what we did, we applied three litres a hectare of the Biotrack on the 20th of June. Uh, and then a fairly hefty herbicide mixture was applied uh, around 12 days later and then we did another three litres a hectare of biotrack on part of the field um, around six weeks after the first application and within the same field there was a comparison with a competitor biostimulant product. When we took pictures 10 days after the herbicide application it was very very clear that where we had applied the biostimulant prior to the herbicide application we had much healthier foliage. Um, the word massive crop damage by any stretch of the means, you, you can see there on the pictures, um, but there is definitely more mottling, more herbicide damage where we didn't apply the biostimulant before that big herbicide mix. Uh, and when we looked at it under the microscope, you could, you could see it a bit clearer. Um, so there was definitely an impact of stress mitigation there. So the biostimulant went on, 10, 11 days later, we put a herbicide on. Um, and you can see it with both of those pictures. But the bit we're all interested in is actually yield. And just worth pointing out at this point that these yield digs were not done by ourselves, they were done by a British sugar area manager who then did, you know, washed them up and got us the, the sugar contents and adjusted yields and everything. And you can see there when we go to the adjusted yield column on the right, the control with no biostimulant did 62 tonnes. The competitor product, one application did just under 64. The Biotrack, one application did 70. The two Biotracks did 77. So we got a very nice rate response. 
And just to put that in bar chart form, um, again, with the red line being the control, you can really see the impact of that buyer track. You have one application delivering a big yield increase, but the nice thing was to see that, uh, that rate response from the two applications. What I have done is just looked at the financials. Um, because I get a lot of people will not use biostimulants just on the off chance they get stress. Um, but if I put the financials into that trial itself, you know, you're looking at 12 to 1 return on investments. It's huge. Um, with sugar beet at £40 a tonne today. And when you think about the current state of the crop, it could be a big argument for applying biostimulants this season in 2023. So ultimately, what is our recommendation on sugar beet? The core recommendation would be three litres a hectare of Brassitol Pro at that four to six true leaf stage to deliver all those key nutrients. We can then add in three litres of Biotrack with that Brassitol Pro, fully compatible. I would then repeat that Biotrack um, around 16 leaf stage, so you know, maybe six weeks after the first one. Um, and then don't forget the importance of that magnesium. Uh, and for, for magnesium, we would recommend a top up magnesium application of two litres a hectare of MagFlow in with the first fungicide. So, the take home messages from this webinar as all our webinars and every single crop, get the basics right first. And I keep banging on about it, but that pH is absolutely critical. When it comes to potatoes, it's very hard to reduce that macronutrition. However, by placing it, we can make it more efficient too late for this year's crop but something to consider um, and if you are looking at moving to placement then please get in touch with your local Yara, Yara area manager or, or be happy to come out and give, give you advice on that. Uh, calcium for me should be soil applied in a soluble form like Tropico from ourselves um, not foliar. It's very very difficult to get calcium down through the, um, through the foliage into the tuber. To maximise tuber numbers, then Yarabit and Magfos K, 10 litres a hectare at tuber initiation. For stress tolerance, then start those biostimulant applications early. If you're going to use ours, then Yarabit and Biotrack, 3 litres a hectare, applied around three weeks after um, full crop emergence, and then another application three weeks after tuber initiation. But if you're going to use it for, for managing stress, it's got to be on before it hits. Don't wait until it's too late. The more common use period for the Magfos K product would be during bulking. And this is where we use it to increase tuber size and ultimately tuber yield and total yield. And again, Magfos K, five litres a hectare, two applications uh, around 14 days apart. If you require zinc, switch to Magfos K into Crop Boost. Don't add Zintrac to the Magfos K. With Sugar Beet, then Brassitrol Pro contains all those nutrients in one can for easy attack mixing. Um, so don't compromise on the nutrients. Buy a multinutrient product and put it in the tank to apply the ball. Three litres a hectare, you know, four to six true leaves. You know, you, you, want, you want a big enough crop, um, but it supplies all those key nutrients required. And then Biotrack twice can improve yields and tolerance to stress. And we need to get this crop to grow as fast as we can to maximize that solar radiation. So for me, it's every year for biostimulants, it's this year. My advice, put three liters of Brassitrol in with three liters of Biotrack as early as possible. And then if, if stress events look like continuing, we can come with a second application of biostimulant six weeks later when we've got a full canopy. And that's brought us to the end of this webinar on root crops, so potatoes and sugar beet. As I've said, there is other webinars on the YouTube channel, one in particular looking at, uh, at calcium management in potatoes. So, so please have a look at that one. And then I've mentioned a lot about tank mixing, do's and don'ts. We have the webinar on, on tank mixing uh, and the new tank mix website. So please also have a look at that. Um, there's a basis code for this, uh, for this webinar. Uh, and you can see we've got two plant nutrition points. That's valid for the basis year ending 31st of May 2023. So get it in before, uh, be, be, before the end of May. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.